Easy Tigers. I hope everyone is fine and dandy. Thank you for tuning in to the Paul Cook Show, where I expose the hidden history. First things first, I want to say a special thank you for the donations, people that have kept me out of the matrix, so I can research this stuff and put the videos together so you can have a little gander. I've set another Patreon up, so please show some love and give us a support over there. Anyway, let's get stuck into it. So, what we're going to be talking about today, and looking at rather, should I say, is the Great Fire of London in 1666. Now, the only reason I chose this is because of the numbers, 1666, 666, and obviously just before that we had the Great Plague, which was in 1566. So that's 156666. Purely just through numerology I chose these dates. And I want to prove to you that at the end of this little documentary you'll know that it's just purely for resets. So we're going to look at what buildings went missing, we're going to look at how many people died, and we're going to look at the plague and all things like that. So let's get stuck into it, shall we? The Great Plague of London, lasting from 1665 to 1666, was the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague to occur in England. It happened with the centuries-long second pandemic. Could you imagine a pandemic for 100 years? Like, you'd have been born into that pandemic, you'd have lived your life and died, and you wouldn't have known any difference. Anyway... So it's a period of time or a period of intermittent bubonic plague epidemics that originated in Central Asia in 1331. Numbers again. Can you see where it's just the same history, same stories, just repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating itself. Let's go. So let's look at the uh, plague, right? And what I want to show you about this plague is this character, which was the plague doctor. Now, I call this, or what I've been taught to call this, is a micromanagement. See, when you see something like this, it puts everything in check in your brain. It lets you remind you that there's a pandemic going on, and it reminds you that you've got to be cautious and aware, and it keeps you in fear. This geezer, or guy, or this, this, this mask would have been brandished everywhere, just to pe keep people in fear back in the day when this... I'm going to call them pandemics because I don't even believe they're real. When you start looking into all this stuff, you start thinking, well, hang on a minute, this happened here, this happened here, this happened here. It's the same story in every country, pretty much. Well, sorry, hang on. The same story in every Western country, pretty much. It is an absolute joke when you look at it. So anyway, and there's no difference between these masks and the masks we wear today. Nothing. None of them work. Anyway, let's go. Right, the plague was one of the most hazardous lives of Britain from the dramatic appearance in 1348 with the Black Death. The bills of mortality begin to be published regularly in 1603. And that's what we see on TV every day. We see numbers published of death and boom, 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 boom. Fear, 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 scared, scared, scared. Anyway, between then and 1605, only four years had no recorded cases. So it must have been a real hard hard time and I've always said this after World War Two up until about five years ago was the best time to live because you was pretty much uninterrupted you know you had a pretty cushy life you, like there weren't much war going on like there weren't not in the Western world you know it's quite quiet in the Western world they're doing their work in other people's back gardens if that makes any sense anyway I've got my hands on one of these bills of mortality let's have a butcher's a butcher's hook means look which is Cockney rhyming I'm not Cockney I've done a lot of work in London I live about 20 miles, 30 miles away from London. That's probably why I sound like this. Anyway, let's crack on. Bills of mortality. So, this was from 1664. So, this was published a few months after they got all the information. So, this was published then, right? Here we go. So, sorry, hang on, sorry. It's published in 1665 from the previous year, 1664. I'll just let you scan over this now because this is not the one I've got my hands on. But you get an idea. And this is just like the news now. This is how they kept it. We've lived the same lives. You know that. As our, as the people from before us. So we've lived the same lives. Let's have a look at this now. Because this was incredible when I see this. Now this is literally. This would be published. And it will tell everyone would read this. And be scared. So a general bill. For the present year. Alright. So that's from the 19th of December 1665. And it's a report. And it says buried. It says, right, it says buried and then due to the plague. So you'll have the area and you'll have buried and then due to the plague. 
Now this section here is people that have had problems. Like you can pause and read this, like it was fascinating. Like you've got cancers there, you've got liver grown, you, you, you've got leprosy, you've got King's Evil, I didn't even know what that was. But at the bottom again, you have people buried and due to the plague. So they're just brandishing these numbers to you. They're just brandishing these numbers to keep you in fear. And it's the same tactic they've used today. And when you actually go to look at the population of London, like it, none of it's right. There's so many different numbers. Look, about 200,000 people in 1660. All right? 200,000 people in 1660. 100,000 common people in 1666. So what, did they lose like 100,000 people? Okay, the Great Plague in England in 1666 indicated that 68,000 people died during the epidemic. And it brought the total population to 460,000. It's just all lies. It's all cobblers. All absolute cobblers. And you don't even have to... You can, this is everywhere. You can go to China and it'll probably do the same stuff if you can read the writing. Let's have a look at America. So it says, not included in the above table are many waves of deadly disease brought by Europeans to Americas and the Caribbean. Western hemisphere populations were decimated mostly by smallpox, but also typhus, measles, influenza, bubonic plague, cholera, malaria, tuberculosis, mumps, yellow fever, and petrusis. Never heard of that one. But the lack of written records in many places and the destruction of many native societies by disease, war and colonisation makes estimates uncertain. All done on purpose. They've gone over there, smashed up the gaff, given diseases and took over. Put the flag down and put an English colony in there. That's what goes on. Like sometimes I just think we are just one ginormous human experiment. And there's so many different little races but now we're just left with what, what's left. You know, we've got Indian, Pakistan, Chinese, you know, like Asian, like white. That's what's left. But I reckon there are so many different other ones. It's just been wiped out. Anyway, London, 1666, during the Back Plague, the Great Fire of London, the Great Fires of London, sorry, Parliament enacted an act beyond closed doors called the Cestial KV Act, 1666. The act can be debated was a subrogate for the rights of men and women, meaning all men and women were declared dead at sea. And it also means that all their property was confiscated of them by the government. So the government owned everything that the people owned unless they proved who they were. So why, why did this go on? Like London city's burning down, there's a plague. Why are uh, parliament behind closed doors knocking up contracts to make people worth nothing and giving up all their ownership and giving up everything they own, all their rights and their property to the government. It seems like it is very fishy to me. Very, very fishy. And we see the same stuff going on now. We see a pandemic going on. We see the Houses of Commons locking the doors and, 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 and writing laws, you know, so no one can go there and protest because everyone's indoors scared. It's the same stuff going on and on and on and on. And you know why? Because they've been getting away with it for so long they just keep doing it. Every now and then there's a revolution, yeah? France in, I think, 18, oh, 1798 had a revolution, boom. Nothing since. We need one now. It's getting out of hand. It's getting out of hand. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about Pudding Lane and all bits and pieces, you know? We're talking about the Great Fire of London, the reset of London, basically. So let's go. Sorry, I'll go off, I'll go off track sometimes. So the Great Fire of London was a major conflagration, conflagration that swept through the central parts of London from Sunday the 2nd of September to Thursday the 6th of September 1666. The fire gutted the medieval city of London inside the Roman Old Wall City. It threatened but did not reach the city of Westminster which is today's West End. Uh, Charles is the second palace of Whitehall and most of the suburban slums. It destroyed 13,200 houses, 87 parish churches, St Paul's Cathedral and most of the buildings of the city's authorities. It estimated destroyed 70,000 out of the 80,000 homes. And another little thing I found interesting, check this geezer's name out, Thomas Bloodworth, or Bloodworth, sorry. He was the guy who was the mayor of London at the time. Is that not coincidental, Bloodbath? 
uh, I don't know, maybe I just think things weird. I don't know, I don't know. It's like that Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson and Jacinda Hardon. Do you know what I mean? It's like all fake names. Biden. Anyway, this is where the fire started, put in lane, EC3. And like I said, it's, it, it seems like it was a gentrification. It got rid of the slums, it got rid of the authority buildings they didn't want, it got rid of loads of stuff. It got rid of loads of stuff. And also out of it, I'll go into that later on, most of the buildings and the authority, right, 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 check this out. And most of the buildings of the city's authorities, it is estimated that it destroyed the homes of 70,000, blah, blah, blah. The death toll of the fire is unknown and is traditionally thought to have been as small as six people. Six people died in a great fire of London. So all these houses were on fire. 70,000 people had to flee their houses and only six people in the, only six people got killed. Incredible. Incredible. All right, your editorial on the Great Fire of London repeats, its, repeats the discredited idea that human casualties were low, perhaps fewer than a dozen deaths. First, official records of the time failed to even record the existence of thousands of poor Londoners, let alone their deaths. So it just goes to show you, it seems to me like they're doing this to get rid of a lower class and rebuild the slums, basically. That's what it seems like, a bit like Grenfell Tower. And where, and with the temperatures reaching 1500 degrees Celsius or more, many victims would have simply been turned to ash. Many also died of starvation and exposure in the aftermath of the fire. According to authorities in 2001 research, the Great Fire actual death toll almost certainly amounted to several thousand. So that seems more realistic. I can imagine like, in a reset, you're going to get rid of the weakest link, the ones that are not generating money, not paying tax, the ones that are a bit of a burden, which would be, you know, like the lower class now, which is me and half of the world, you know? So that is why they're resetting us, they're getting rid of us. And they've been doing this for years and years and years and years and donkey's years. So it's just incredible, really. But let's have a look at uh, some, some buildings that decided to go missing around this period. It's very, very peculiar. I'm going to start off with one that was a twin building of the Great Tower of London. But not a lot of people have heard of this place, and it's called Barnard's Castle. So let's have a little butcher's hook. As usual, a few sites, a few buildings have been built on the site, but the most recent one was the second and was the most medieval palace built in a short distance to the southeast and was destroyed by the Great Fire of London in 1666. So, Barnard's Castle. And that was brown bread in 1666. So let's have a look what else it says. Built a large extension around the second courtyard in 1551. The Herbert family took after the side of the Civil War and after 1660, restoration of the monarchy and the house were occupied by Francis Talbot. Barnard's castle was left in ruins after the Great Fire of London in 1666. The site is occupied now by what is called the BT office, Barnard's house. Right, so I've managed to find some pictures of Barnard's Castle or Baynard's Castle and it seems to be like a quite high, very very high building and another interesting thing, it was built into the shoreline so imagine the work gone in to this, you'd have had to put scaffolding up in the water first of all you've had to hold the water back, you know, to lay the foundations, that's a job on its own but we're not, I'm not talking about that, I'm just talking about it's here, now it's gone but look at it and the next picture is incredible and all. You just see, look at it. How old is that? But apparently it was built in the 1200s and then burnt down in the 1600s, but God knows, God knows. I don't know what to say about that one. Now let's have a look. Now this is another picture of it. Now let's have a look at the Great Conduit. Has anyone heard of the Great Conduit? Being a plumber, this is what my next video is going to be about because this is so fascinating I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Now basically what I found is there used to be shrines in cities like massive ginormous ornate shrines and these shrines were called conduits and water, fresh water, water sorry, would come from springs and mountains miles and miles, hundreds of miles away. All right so that tells you that these cats dug these tunnels and kept it clean and fresh and brought it all the way to London 
from out in the sticks from miles away. Yeah? With what technology? How did they know where to go without lasers? And how did they know what they're digging into without Cat and Jenny scanners? Very fishy stuff. Ancient knowledge we're not taught about. But let's go. The conduits were generally sighted in the middle of the streets with an elevated lead tank having multiple outlet pipes from which water could be drawn. The great conduit was not round, it was rectangular. This was clearly shown in the map on the 1550s, copied in figure one. It was sighted at the junction of Cheapside with Poultry. Seven tankards are shown alongside the left. The Great Fire of London in 1666 severely damaged many of the pipelines and conduits, became intense, heat melted the lead. The Great Conduit was deemed irreparable and ordered to be taken down in 1669. Now what's fascinating about that is they've managed to direct this fresh water from hundreds of miles away and keep it fresh and they've managed to direct it to specific points in London underground. Okay, and this was done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So they had no Cat and Jenny machines. They didn't know where there's drilling or cutting into or pickaxing into as they want to say so how did they do that how did they channel that water hundreds of miles and keep it clean to be drank and used in london so this is the course it runs and you can see that it comes from well out of london and it's pretty much in two straight lines so how did they do that without lasers come on help me out help me out how is this done without lasers now this is a picture of it of one of the pumps and this is another picture on the map of the pump house and you can see it was square you go then you go and get your fresh clean and it wasn't just london and they had these great conduits they're all over the place in every major city not even major cities in smaller towns as well they were everywhere so this was ancient knowledge of of obtaining fresh clean water and it's funny that we have to pay for the water now hey it's funny that the great fire of london that comes along Everyone in poverty goes, yeah, and we now got to pay for water. All the, all the slums are gone, and they build back better. Crazy. One other thing, the River Thames used to be called Isis. Don't believe me, check it out. Check it out. Londinium and Isis. The River Thames was alternatively known in parts as River Isis. There you go. There you go. But again, I believe all this is man-made now. 100% it has to be all man-made. So another great building that got demolished or wiped out in the Great Fire of London is St Paul's Cathedral. Part of me thinks these fires didn't wipe out these buildings and it's all a lie and they've just used this as an excuse to say they've rebuilt stuff recently. But imagine this stuff's thousands of years old or a thousand years old. Anyway, the old St Paul's Cathedral was the cathedral in the city of London that until the Great Fire London stood on the site of the present St Paul's Cathedral. Built from 18, oh sorry, 1087 to 1314 and dedicated to St Paul, the cathedral was perhaps the fourth church in Ludgate Hill. See, that's quite remarkable because Ludgate Hill is a small area. And there's four churches in there. And churches for me were old healing centres. Healing, healing centres, that's what I believe they were. Work on the cathedral began after the Great Fire in 18, oh, I've done it again, 1087. So again, there was another reset. Work took over 200 years. Work took 200 years. So what, so some geezer could sit there and have lunch and say, oh, my great granddad worked on this job. He was doing this part. It's all cobblers. It's, this, what I'm reading to you now is cobblers. I don't even know I'm reading it, to be honest with you, but I'm just giving you the backstory so we can have a laugh. So it took 200 years and it was delayed by another fire in 1135. A church was consecrated in 1240, enlarged in 1256 and again in early 1300s. As its completion in the mid 1300s, the cathedral was one of the longest churches in the world. Oh, and by the way, when it got burnt down, I think it was the tallest building in Europe. So I think it was 300 metres. Now imagine, nearly a thousand years ago, putting scaffolding up to build this thing and not only that it was around a spire so it gets smaller at a point so the scaffolding is is quite hard to, to do scaffolding 
on points and, and cylinder things. But anyway, so here's some plans of the uh, cathedral, the new cathedral, shall we say. And you can see the geometric <coughs> patterns inside it. And you can actually see, this is the old one, look at the intricacy. Imagine how advanced you have to be to come up with something like that. It is incredible. I'm telling you now, they won't be able to build that today. I'm telling you now. Let's go to Newgate. Newgate was a prison. Now, this is another thing. If this prison, all right, well, Newgate was part of a prison on a, yeah, right. Anyway, if only six people died, how comes all the people banged up in Newgate prison didn't die? I digress. I digress. They'd have all been burnt alive. Obviously. But that went missing. Newgate prison went missing. So a load of prisoners went missing. So who was in that prison when that place got burnt down, eh? Another thing that got damaged was the old London Bridge, the one that had people living on it, that had houses. I think it had 912 residents. And they used to put the heads on spikes to warn off criminal, 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 blink here now, criminals, fun loving criminals. So yeah, London Bridge, it housed, it housed people, it had shops, and people lived on there. What an incredible structure again, built over water. Incredible. But what's funny about this is there's a specific building called Non Sush. And that building is the only building that didn't get demolished or it didn't get affected in the Great Fire of London. Now how fishy is that? So you're telling me a bridge, bridge worth of houses and buildings get wiped out yet this one building survives don't make no sense don't make no sense so this is a building that survived swerved the fire oh and another thing that made me laugh when I was doing some research on the Great Fire of London it also said that the fire leaped the Thames like it was doing some Olympic challenge you know what I mean it leaped the fire leaped the Thames like you want us to believe this sort of stuff come on yeah you know why? It's because we're fed this as kids in school. And you don't know nothing else, you don't believe anything else, and you're just sitting there, so you just take it in. And it just gets stored in your subconscious. So. Now this building's a bit fishy, it's the old Royal Exchange. But I'm going to tell you now, the old Royal Exchange, it just, it, the building didn't burn down. They just switched buildings, basically, and I've got proof, because I can show it to you now. Anyway. Gresham's original building was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666. A second complex was built on the site, designed by Edward Jarman and opened in 1669. It featured a tall wooden tower over the south entrance in Cornhill. This eventually fell into disrepair and in 1821 was replaced by a new stone tower and cupola designed by George Smith. The second exchange was also burned down on the 10th of January 1838. A fire caused by the overheated stove, the blaze was visible from Windsor, 24 miles away. So the reptiles got to see the place burning basically. It had been used by Lloyd's insurance market, which was forced to move temporarily to South Sea House following the fire of 1838 so you can see it was made of stone made of wood made of stone then made of stone again and it's been attacked by about four fires that's what we've been told now let me just show you what i found out it was quite quite interesting now this is the building now in london as i speak this is the actual building the exchange in london now it has two roads either side of it now this is the exchange in the 1700s Okay, it's the same building, it hasn't changed. Now, even though it's been told it's been built twice since then. Now the building that's just popped up is the old exchange and I believe it's the one that's got the arrow on the left of the screen. So I believe they just switched buildings and put founded next to it and come up with a load of backstories that this one got burnt, this one got burnt, we built this one, we built this one and now we've got this one left. 
and it's just cobblers it's just absolute cobblers because another thing is these exchange buildings all over the world look pretty much identical as well they look identical let me just show you this so this is london on the right hand side you've got the royal exchange and on the left hand side you've got the the old royal exchange so i believe this building on the right was always there it was built at the same time as the one on the left that's what i believe but I believe they said they got destroyed in fires and they've rebuilt it, but it's, it's the same architecture. It looks like it's the same material. It's done at the same time. Now this is inside. Very grand building. Very, very grand building. Now this is the old one. It doesn't look like it could be the building in the middle of the road. It looks like it could have been the building, building on the side of the road. But this is what's interesting. This is what I found very interesting. Royal Exchange Assurance for fire, sea, life and immunities. So basically, in the Great Fire of London, what happened after that was, if you weren't insured, a fireman wouldn't come round or an insurance company wouldn't come round and put your fire out. So it seems like this was another way to get money out of people and another reason to have a Great Fire of London is to bring out this sort of thing. And if you look at the name, it says Hancock. Now Hancock was the medical secretary in England for the NHS. I can't, I don't know what he is. I'm not involved in all that stuff. Like I hear bits here and there, but I know he was like a medical secretary or something. Now I wonder if it's kept in the families because they're in the same sort of line of business, you know? I wonder if this is a relative of his because it's only a couple of hundred years ago. But yeah, if you caught on fire, they come round and put it out basically in a nutshell and if you weren't if you didn't have insurance they wouldn't so you look at the secretary hancock at the bottom and it also says if you get hit by lightning they'll come and pay out and all if there's a fire but read that have a read so anyway the old royal exchange have a look at this 1566 is when it was apparently built so and this is the one in antwerp 1460 I know the photo is not 1460 but apparently it was built in 1460 now they say they based this one on this one which yeah fair enough no problem but how could you base that one first if it was built second it don't make no sense I'm gonna base this on something that was built in the future hmm okay mate so let's have it right. We've been blasted in England and around the world with pandemics and disease and all sorts of stuff. And then they go around blowing up our towns and cities. Just look at all the fires. It's like there's one every year. It's like a ceremony. That's what it's like. Check it out. They had a little break in the 16th century. They had their hands busy with plagues. But look, if you go to the 17th century or the 1600s, the Great Fire of London, it's like every single year there's something going on. Well, not every year, but you know, like too consistent, too consistent for my liking. There should be like no none of that. But these are all just resets. That's all they are. They're just resets. Look, the Great Fire in New York, 1776, was a devastating fire, and it killed it just blah 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 blah. Outcome: 400 to a thousand structures destroyed. Have a look at the picture. So they're just resets. They're just recorded resets. They get printed in our subconscious. So we look back and go, oh look, it happened back then as well. And then, and then. Do you know what? I salute the human race. I really do. Do you know how strong we are to sit there and go for all that crap? And we're still here. We're still here. Like we get blasted by all this stuff. Like they really must. They can't be human, these controlling people. Or as Howdy McCloskey calls them, influencers, which is brilliant. Now, these are the tools they used to uh, put out the fire of London. And if you had insurance, one of these little gadgets would turn up. Now, I don't know how in the world that got from A to B. Like, the, the people must push it. They must have pushed it, surely. But do you know how hard it is to push? A bin of water. It's very hard. 
Like once you push it and it's in motion, it will not stop on its own, and it'll put, it'll judder everywhere, and water will splash out. So it, it must have gone. Even a horse would have had problems with that, I guess. But like I said, the fire insurance mark. This is what it was. If the building had this little plaque outside, and some do still have them on buildings in London, but if you had that, then the insurance company would come round. Look, even in Sydney, I don't know why they're saving a sheep. That's funny, wasn't it? Sheep getting saved. <laughs> that was ironic. And then that's how London Fire Brigade would come about. It come out of stuff like that. So, give us a like, subscribe, comment, share, share the love, all that jazz. Uh, definitely let me know what you think as well because I'm, I'm curious to know what you think. I strongly believe these are all resets, all of it. And I believe we're living in one now. So, what happened in London after the fire? So, London had to be almost totally reconstructed. Temporary buildings were erected and the ill-equipped disease spread easily. And many more people died from this and the harsh winter that followed the fire. As well as the loss of life, the financial costs were staggering. 13,200 houses, 87 parish churches, the Royal Exchange, the Guildhall and St Paul's Cathedral built during the Middle Ages, was totally destroyed. The cost was estimated £10 million. Shortly after, a clever businessman spotted an opportunity to provide the, the surety of insurance through reduce their risk of financial losses by employing men to extinguish fires. The first fire brigades were formed. Anyway, let's have a Brucey bonus. Let's have a Brucey Brucey bonus. Um, Basically, I see viewers talking about these melted buildings in part of a, a video yesterday on Sunday. And it's, it's not melted. It's, it's meant to be like that. It was cast. It's like this. This is not melted. This is cast. This has been designed like that. No one's put fertilizer in there and this has grown or no one's, this is not melted red brick. This is cast limestone or sandstone. So it's Polo Gym here. And then they've cave, carved houses into it. That's all it is. And that's why it's called cast, because you cast it. Look, this is not melted. Nothing here is melted. This is all done on purpose. Now, this picture was quite fascinating because you can see a square base underneath it and you can see two objects, one sitting on top of the other. This is not natural. This is not natural. People that think this is natural, I've got no help for you. Look, this is what it is. And again, this looks like more entrances into, into the UK by these man-made coastlines. But this one was quite interesting. This looked like a wall with um, a couple of pillars holding it up. I mean, what was this? How did this form? If this was natural, what, what how, how? Explain to me, please. And look at the 45 degree angle as well. Come on, give me a break. And one more other thing. I was doing some walking in my local woods and I come across loads of bungaroosh and bungaroosh is smashed up buildings put together with concrete basically and there was melted red brick in there and I couldn't believe it like I'm in the middle of the woods I'm about 10 miles away from anything and I'm finding bungaroosh and melted brick and then while I was on my travels again I come across this, so I'm gonna clean this up. Well, I've cleaned it up, actually. I've done a good job on it. And so if anyone knows anything, I'll have to date this and work out what it is used for or anything, let me know. It's proper bright copper as well. Beautiful. Cleaned it right up, but there's no markings on it or nothing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to give us a like, subscribe, comment, share, all that jazz. And I hope today I've made you realise that the great fires of London and all that lot are just resets. Just like we're going through now. Anyway, one love. Ta-da. Ta-da.